Well, good morning to you. Thank you for your good mornings and checking in. Uh, are we all ready, team? All right, we've got the thumbs up. This is wonderful. Thank you for tuning in and being here with us today. I wish to extend our gratitude to Earth Day Live 2020 and the Sonoma Sunrise Group and to all the many wonderful presenters who have shared their wisdom here during Earth Day Live 2020. What wonderful offerings. I'm so grateful to be invited here today. My name is Nicole Warwick and I am the Environmental Health Programs Manager for Daily Acts Organization in Sonoma County, California. It is my pleasure to be your weaver of context and facilitator of process for this workshop. Got eco-anxiety? Resilience tools for thriving during the climate crisis. During this webinar, we will explore the impacts of stress and anxiety caused by the climate crisis, as well as current implications with COVID-19. We will practice evidence-based mind-body medicine and creative connection tools that reduce stress and anxiety, boost our psychological resilience, and help us tap into our inner wisdom in order to imagine the regenerative, sustainable responses to this crisis. I'd like to begin by introducing my amazing colleagues, Serena Consulter and Connor Devane. Hi, everyone. Good morning, everybody. My name is Serena. I'm a programs coordinator at Daily Acts, and I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning. Good morning. My name is Connor. I'm also a programs coordinator with Daily Acts, and so looking forward to this next hour. Thank you all for being here. Serena and Connor will be running all the behind the scenes aspects of this webinar, and I'm truly grateful for their support. Um, they're going to help us with questions and answers and the social media. So should you have any questions or wish to share information during this webinar, please use the Q&A function and we will make time during the presentation to address your questions as best we can. We recognize that this is the third day of Earth Day Live online offerings and there is an overall increase in online communications due to the shelter in place. Many of us are spending a lot of time in front of our screens. We may be experiencing some fatigue. Our eyes may feel tired, our minds full of information while we navigate all this change, and our bodies may feel restless. We might be feeling saturated with information and emotions. So during this webinar, we encourage you to take care of yourself. It's okay to get up, to move around, to listen to your body's needs, and to take measures to make yourself comfortable. I'm wrapped up in my shawl on my back deck, with the trees and the birds and my warm cup of tea, I encourage you to do something similar to make yourself nice and comfy. You don't need to be in front of the screen to participate in this webinar. However, because we all have limited access to natural and wild places during the shelter in place, we thought you would appreciate images of nature and wildlife. Serena and Connor are also the artists responsible for the beautiful visual media display during this presentation. I wanna give a shout out and thank you to Serena for your flower photography from our garden installation projects and to Connor for sharing imagery from your documentary, Hike the Divide. To learn more about our gardening programs or Hike the Divide, check out the links in the chat box. Serena, Connor and I work for Daily Acts a holistic education nonprofit that takes a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative actions that create connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. We believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, community, and place, which helps to heal our society and planet. Our holistic approach starts in the soil and swells into culture and policy change. You see, we spread solutions and models that offer the skills and resources to conserve while growing food, medicine, habitat, and community. 
Because change happens through mindful collaboration, we also invest in strengthening community leadership by equipping leaders who understand the interrelations of social, economic, and environmental justice issues through our networks, alliances, and leadership programs. These efforts consolidate into building public and political will by mobilizing our community's power towards environmental and climate justice policies. Our impact over the last 18 years has been to create solutions and models that ripple through our community, catalyzing action, building community, and supporting leaders to boldly advocate for a brighter future. We've implemented over 1,400 programs, inspired tens of thousands of resilience building projects, installed dozens of demonstration gardens for fire survivors, homeless veterans, schools, and much more. And just in the last five years, dealing with record drought, flood, and fire, we've launched new coalitions, as well as new programs to support the environmental health needs of vulnerable populations and to build civic engagement through our leadership programs. I feel grateful, really grateful for my work managing the environmental health programs and supporting the Leadership Institute and all of Daily Act's programs. We truly do have the best community of volunteers, staff, board members, and alliances that help make it a wonderful place to work. <sighs> it's good stuff. Let's take a moment and pause and just breathe together. Breathing in slowly through our noses, exhaling thoroughly through our mouths, and let's just keep breathing. For when we breathe in, we inspire. And when we breathe out, we expire. And when we breathe together, we conspire. And I quite like the idea of us conspiring together simply through our breath. I invite you to join me in acknowledging the land upon which you currently reside and the indigenous peoples who first lived upon the land. This land I live upon was once Pomo land. I also invite you to acknowledge the land of your ancestors, to send love to that land too. I was recently told it's not enough to simply acknowledge our land's history, that acknowledging an injustice and doing nothing to restore justice is empty. I was invited and I extend this invitation to us all to consider how we might engage in acts of decolonization, actions that honor the land, the waters, and all of creation, actions that support the indigenous communities who have been and continue to be greatly impacted by the historical and social traumas of colonization. Their wisdom is needed now, and it is time for reparations. In our society, we have a tendency to move quickly and bypass our feelings, especially grief. This is why we tend to have such high anxiety. This is an output of being colonized. So when we make space to process our emotions and grief, we are engaging in acts of decolonization, acts that decolonize our minds, our bodies, and our hearts. When we make space to discuss and explore the emotional and psychological impacts of climate change on our lives and the lives of those more vulnerable than us, we are decolonizing our minds. And when we slow down enough to listen to our bodies and feel our emotions, we are decolonizing our bodies. And when we hold space for grief, for others and our own, and can express our grief and witness grief with loving kindness, we are decolonizing our hearts. So I offer this talk and experiential process as an act of decolonization and reparations in honor of the planet and all indigenous peoples whose wisdom is so desperately needed now. <clears throat> I'm assuming if you're tuning in, you've experienced eco-anxiety. It's important to acknowledge the realities and difficulties of this time. 
not to dwell on them, but to name them so we can remediate them. We're dealing with the impacts of climate change, COVID-19, economic instability, political instability, social injustices, environmental injustices, distress, exponential uncertainty. In addition, we all have our own stuff, our own issues that we're navigating during this time. Experiencing stress and anxiety in response to these times is a natural response, a protective and informative response that's telling us something's not right. You see, stress is an internal response to external conditions and experiences. No two people respond to the same stressful event in the same way. What is perceived as incredibly stressful for one person may not be so for another. So understanding our own unique stress physiology, <clears throat> where it comes from, how to regulate it, and how to be compassionate towards ourselves is at the heart of resiliency efforts. There are significant impacts of stress and trauma on health. You see, we are these beautifully complex biologies of emotions, thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes. The interconnections between the mind, body, heart, and spirit exemplify our holistic nature. Stress is not just mental. It's physiological, psychological, and spiritual. Man, let's face it. These are stressful times we're living in. In fact, the greatest health risk associated with the climate crisis is mental health. The National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences identifies the urgent need to build personal and psychological resilience for climate change. Well, what does that mean? It means we need to build our capacity to cope with the trauma of climate catastrophes, to learn and grow together in our strong social networks, and to cultivate resilience practices so that we may thrive while living with the uncertainty inherent to climate disruption and inherent to this current situation of shelter in place with COVID-19. Resilience work starts with us. We must put the metaphorical oxygen mask on ourselves first before we can help others or else we risk our own health. And we can influence our health and healing using these science-based tools that help boost our resilience and enable us to participate in our own healing process. The most basic of these tools is our breath. So what do you do when you're just feeling too much stress and the anxiety is building? I think we've all been there. Well, pause and breathe. Bring your awareness to this present moment and focus on your breath. Our breath is our key to control. So let's practice. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. Otherwise, just allow your vision to soften. Breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. Breathe the air downward to the bottom of your lungs. And notice how your belly expands with each breath in and relaxes with each breath out. This will deepen the breath and improves the exchange of oxygen, helping relax nerves and muscles. With each breath in, say to yourself, soft and with each breath out say to yourself belly soft belly if thoughts come let them come and then just as easily let them go each time coming back to the breath and soft belly. 
Let's do it together a few more times. I encourage you to do this two or three times a day, anytime you're feeling tense or stressed, and at bedtime too, if you're having trouble sleeping. Each day you might try to add another minute or two until you're practicing for 10 minutes or longer. And you'll find as you practice this, because it is a practice, that simply beginning with a pause and a breath in and out, and the words soft and belly, you'll find that relaxation comes quickly. All right, so I wanna break down the biological and psychological implications of stress. So biologically, our autonomic nervous system is comprised of two components. The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now the sympathetic nervous system is what triggers that fight or flight or freeze response. It enables a cascade of stress hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine to be released that then produce a well-orchestrated physiological response that prepares us for danger. Our heart rate increases, blood vessels dilate, Blood flow constricts within the body's core, muscles tighten, our breathing sh becomes shallow, and we're like, we're primed, we're ready for action. The other component is the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the part of our nervous system that promotes rest and digest responses that help calm our body down. The parasympathetic nervous system is what we can engage when we use these mind-body medicine and creative connection tools like breathing, movement, meditation, and creativity. Now, psychologically, um, I want to use, I like to use a hand-brain model to explain this. So here's my hand, let's imagine this. Our amygdala, is my thumb here, is like the command center for the autonomic nervous system. It's located in the center of the brain and it regulates our emotional processing and communicates distress to the hypothalamus. Now, if you imagine the amygdala in the center of the brain, we have the cerebral cortex here that covers it, our prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for our executive functioning and our wise leader self here. And then here we have this, the limbic, our brain stem, which is more of our primitive instinctual part of, of our brain. All right, so what happens in a stress response is the amygdala gets stimulated. When the amygdala gets stimulated, big emotions, like anxiety and fear and anger kind of take over and override. And our wise leader self goes offline. So then we're making decisions from this very primal, reactive, instinctive, limbic part of our brain, which is the part of our brain that doesn't have that executive functioning ability to, to plan ahead, to think of all the potential consequences. So if we're stressed about climate change and our lid is flipped and our amygdala is activated and we're making decisions, from this very primitive part of ourselves, um, we're gonna be in a bad place when we're done with all of this. So it behooves us to do the work that we can to help calm our nervous system, bring our, our executive functioning, our wise leader self back online so that we can make decisions um, from a, a more centered and calm place. Now, emotional responses to psychological stress can be strong and sometimes feel very unpredictable. Past stressors and traumas can affect our emotional responses to stress. It's how we learned how to deal with stress from our families. 
influences it. Mental health issues can complicate emotional responses. And then also our spiritual orientations impact that psychological framework from which we understand what's happening to ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves about now. And then all of this impacts us as social beings. Um, we talk a lot about the fight, flight, or freeze stress response. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. There's another stress response that I'm noticing a lot, uh, the tend and befriend stress response, where people actually gather and come together to take care of each other, to feed each other, and to share resources, to see what's needed. This is the stress response I'm tending to see more of um, in our community. So all this really means is it's really valuable for us to understand what triggers us. And psychological triggers occur when anything causes a strong or undesirable emotional response. So stimuli like smells, sounds, a song, sights, those all can trigger strong emotions, evoke things like fear, sadness, panic, grief and even post-traumatic stress. Most main triggers for people include uncertainty, a lack of information, and a loss of control. Sound familiar? It's kind of like what we're living through right now. Uncertainty, lack of information, and some loss of control. We also experience triggers when we feel as though we're not getting our needs met. So what happens when we have this stress response? Like it's good to identify it, to assess it and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed right now, but what do I do? Well, we wanna interrupt a stress response pattern. And we do this with the breath work, but sometimes just breathing's not enough. Sometimes it's really hard to sit still and breathe. Sometimes we need to get physical and shake it off. Peter Levine in Waking the Tiger said that traumatic symptoms stem from the frozen residue of energy that's not been resolved or discharged. This residue remains trapped in the nervous system and can wreak havoc on our body. You see, we're essentially animals. Our bodies need movement and stressful energies definitely need to be discharged. So movement helps release tension and that built up energy. So we're gonna shake it off. We're gonna practice shaking off. This is one of my favorite things to do. You can do it pretty much anywhere and anyone regardless of physical restrictions can practice shaking it off in one way or another. Even if it's just a finger or a foot or something that you can shake, we're gonna shake it. So we're, I'm gonna have Connor cue up our music for us and then I'm gonna show you what this looks like. There's different ways that this can be done. You can do it sitting down and just shake. And I'm gonna stand. So, nice, all of you on the crowd.
Thank you. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Thank you. All right. So you can see um, that shaking it off is a great way to just move that energy off. Um, I really, I want to thank Connor and Serena for shaking it off with me. It really, it was great to see. I can't see any of our attendees. And so really I'm looking at a screen talking to the, to the ethers. So it was really great to have that feedback. Thanks you guys. I'm curious if anyone has any questions about shaking. I know that um, for me, shaking for as little as two minutes can really help discharge that energy. I sometimes use this periodically through the day in my work day. Like if I find um, uh, a moment where I'm feeling really stressed or I'm noticing that stress response for myself or where I'm getting triggered, I will excuse myself. The bathroom is my favorite place to shake it off. It just feels contained. People don't see me. I'm also, you know, sitting with a little bit of vulnerability that y'all just watched me shake it off on video. So, you know, here's to being vulnerable. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so ideally you would shake for somewhere like five minutes. You could shake up to 30 minutes and there's really no wrong way to shake. You're just shaking it off and, and loosening up your body and getting the energy to flow in your body. All right. I don't, oh, we do have a question. Ah, do you think any particular kind of music is better? Excellent question. Um, oftentimes, because I'm doing it at work, I'm not even using music. For today, we used Osho Kundalini music. Um, a fast rhythm beating African drumming is a great one to be able to do this too, but any kind of music will work. Now, what I didn't do, um, and we're just gonna skip ahead. After we shake, what you're gonna wanna do is find a minute of just stillness. So you're gonna shake it off and then just stand in that stillness and practice your breathing. All right, that helps us come back to that calm place. So the shaking is the disruptive element. And then we find our calm center through our breath again. And then we can help repattern or rewire based on what we do next. So I want to encourage you to either, after you shake and pause, to move right into some other kind of movement or dance. Put on your favorite music. Anything that's going to get you moving, that feel-good music, um, is great. And, and that's really um, depending on, on your style and what you like. The idea is that once you disrupt the pattern, you find your place of calm, and, and then you replace it with, with a preferred um, a movement or feeling. Thanks for that question, that was great. So, um, when I'm able to stay centered and in the present moment, I feel a sense of calm that's not available to me when I'm lost in reflection of the past or projecting into the unknown future. When I reflect with longing of the way it used to be, like even like six weeks ago before shelter in place, I get drawn into depressed thoughts. And when I project into the future, I can feel overwhelmed by uncertainty and fear and that leads to anxious thoughts. So these tools, like breathing and shaking it off, help me to be here now, because the work is here, now. Unrecognized and unresolved stress and emotions are the breeding grounds for anxiety. Psychological and emotional resiliency refers to our ability to be here now with what is and adapt to the stressful situations or these crises using our own inner wisdom. Yes, adapting and surviving is great, truly. Yet we don't wanna be stuck in survival patterns either. We wanna thrive. We wanna live and celebrate the beauty of this world. 
We want to create and bring forth our most audacious and needed ideas and to engage in meaningful activities that give us pleasure and a sense of connection. We want to thrive and to thrive is to be resilient. So I want to share some essential tools for psychological resiliency. First, and, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is to trust our grieving process and the natural flow of emotions. Anxiety is a sign that there are unexpressed emotions, particularly grief. Grief can look like anger, denial, despair, bargaining, shock, guilt, remorse, even acceptance and action. Grief is messy, it's complex, and it is a nonlinear process. Grief is a threshold emotion, which Francis Weller says is subversive, undermining our society's quiet agreement that we will behave and be in control of our emotions. It's an act of protest that declares our refusal to live numb and small. There's something feral about grief, something essentially outside the ordained and sanctioned behaviors of our culture. And because of that, grief is necessary to the vitality of the soul. At the heart of it all, our feelings need to be acknowledged so that they can shift and move. They're fluid things. They don't want to be stuck. How do we do this? Well, one, I think, engage with curiosity and compassion for ourselves. Like, try to have beginner's mind, to be open and flexible, to not have to have it all figured out. Be willing to learn something new about yourself and about the world through this experience. And when you're doing that, be aware of your body. Be aware of your somatic experiences and what's happening to you. Movement, like walking and dancing, and yoga, the shaking, qigong, tai chi, or other forms of exercise really help move stagnant energies and emotions. Never forget that nutrition matters. Nutrient-dense foods, clean, organic, whole foods, good fats during times of stress are very helpful for the nervous system. And never underestimate the healing power of restorative sleep. I read an article this morning that indicate that people are dreaming more intensely and recalling their dreams more during this time. Let that be um, a feedback for you about what's going on on your deep subconscious. For me, I also find great comfort and resilience when I spend time connecting with nature. Now, I know we all have limited accessibility at this time because of the shelter in place. And I am very fortunate to live in a wooded area where I get to experience wildlife and nature. But if you don't have that, I encourage you to do something simple like find a sit spot in nature next to a tree. Let your senses just take in the surroundings. Take a walk and notice the flowers blooming. Plant or tend a garden. Learn how to grow your own food. Harvest rainwater. Or even just spend time in nature doing what nurtures you. Maybe it's play. Maybe it's building. Maybe it's doing nothing, just sitting and watching the grass grow. For me, where I can overlap nature and creativity, that's my sweet spot. I want to encourage us all to be engaging in creativity and art and some form of creative expression. 45 minutes of creative activity reduces stress hormones and increases the production of serotonin and dopamine, which are our feel-good hormones. So something as basic as sitting and coloring for 45 minutes is actually quite therapeutic for us. Imagine that. 
When we create and innovate, we're using more of our brain's potential for problem solving. We need that right now. We can consciously respond, creatively adapt, and psychologically transform during this time. And art and creative self-expression not only can feel like it saves our lives, but it is the solution that we need right now in the world, beauty, creativity, innovation. It's not outside of us, it's inside of us, waiting to be brought forth into the world. Something that I would also encourage us all to do is find a way to be the change. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Be the leader, become that leader that you know you are. Step up, speak out, and give voice to what you're called to do. Stand up for what you love. Having a sense of agency helps keep us in the game. It keeps us engaged. It focuses our energies towards something meaningful and hopeful. I don't know about you, but I'm really holding on to things that are meaningful, that inspire me. In fact, right now, you could go online at dailyacts.org and sign up for our Leadership Institute or find a similar opportunity to step into leadership in your community. We need you now. All right, I wanna check and see if we have any questions. Does anybody have any questions going forward? Okay. Wow. Now we're getting to the good juicy, juicy stuff. This is where we get to practice um, our own creativity, to tap into our imaginations, to see what we can do at this time. <coughs> We're going to practice a guided imagery. Guided imagery is the conscious use of our imagination to create positive images or healing visualizations in order to bring about healthy mental ch changes for, for us, our mental changes, physiological changes. Um, creating mental images really is nothing new for most people. I mean, we daydream all the time. Guided imagery just takes that natural step, the natural process a step further. So using guided visualization, you can learn to communicate more effectively with your unconscious mind and request that your body function in an optimal and healthy way. And this belief that the power of imagination can help people heal has very ancient roots. Traditional folk healers known as shamans use guided imagery to treat ailments, in Eastern medicine, envisioning well-being has always been an important part of the therapeutic process. In Tibetan medicine in particular, creating a mental image of a, of a healing deity or God would improve that patient's chances of recovery. Even all the way back to ancient Greece, Aristotle and Hippocrates, Hippocrates known as the father of modern medicine, also had their patients imagery in their healing process. So we are going to use guided imagery to seek counsel from our subconscious or our higher self in order to tap into our deep inner wisdom and receive some specific guidance for us about this time. So I wanna check in with my support team. Connor, I know when we did the shaking and dancing, we had the music playing, we weren't able to have my microphone. So let's just, maybe we won't do the music to this piece. Thank you. Thanks for your flexibility. All right, everybody, let's do this. I wanna invite you to find a really comfortable spot. You can lie down or you can sit in a comfortable position. Good. Feel your body against the floor or the chair feeling the support of the ground beneath and the earth beneath us all. Allow your body to soften and just let yourself be. You may close your eyes 
or let your vision soften. Allow your awareness to move to your breath, aware of the in-breath, aware of the out-breath. Breathing in, feeling calm, breathing out at peace, preparing to go on a mental journey. I invite you to imagine yourself deeply rooted to the earth through your feet and the base of your spine. Imagine yourself connected to the pulse of the planet and the mycelial network that feeds and nourishes all living things. You are a part of all of life. Breathe into this connectivity. Imagine yourself energetically rooted into the universe through the top of your head. Imagine yourself connected to all of life, all that has ever lived and all that will ever live. Imagine all the love in the universe like a psychic mycelial network that intuits your needs and responds to your desires. The earth and the universe are supporting you. All of life conspires for your benefit. I invite you to imagine yourself in a very special place. It could be a real place, a place you may actually have been, a beautiful spot in nature or a comforting place in your own home. Your special place may even be an imaginary place, a place of fairy tales. It could be indoor, outdoor, it doesn't really matter. Should more than one place come to mind, allow yourself to just stay with one of them. What matters most is that in this place, you are completely comfortable and secure. You feel comfortable and safe. I invite you to appreciate this scene with all of your senses, to listen to the sounds, smell the aromas, and feel the air as it caresses your skin. Imagine yourself touching and feeling the whole environment that you are in. Notice what you're wearing, what you have on your feet. Notice the seasons, the time of year, the time of day. Notice your age and whether you are alone or if someone else is there with you. Feel the air on your skin as if you are there. Notice the qualities of the place that make it safe and comfortable. Look around to see if there's anything else that would make this place more comfortable. Perhaps there's something that you need to remove or something you need to bring in. Go ahead and do that now. And as you breathe, notice how your body feels in this place. The 
this place is always available to you. And now looking into the distance, you notice a wise and helpful being moving slowly towards you, coming to offer support and guidance. There's nothing threatening about this experience. You feel safe and comfortable. Begin to picture this wise being who is greeting you. It may be a man, a woman, a child, an elder, an ancestor, an animal, or even just a presence or a feeling. Be with this being and notice how its energy feels to you. If this being makes you feel warm, comfortable and secure, you know it is your inner guide, your wise self, or your spirit guide, however you wanna qualify that. I invite you to greet this being as you feel appropriate. You can make contact in any way that feels right, through thoughts, words, touch, movement. This wise being is here to help you, to support you. This wise being may have a message for you I encourage you to listen to the message and accept it as it is. Perhaps you have a question that you'd like to ask. Now's a good time. Your wise being may have a gift for you. Accept it if it is offered. Try not to analyze or interpret it. Just receive. And listen for any special guidance. Now I will be silent for a moment so you can spend some time with your wise being. Imagine yourself filling with gratitude. Offer your thanks to your wise being.
it's time to say goodbye now. But please remember that this special place is always available to you. And you can always return anytime, simply by what you're doing now. Breathing, centering, imagining. When you're ready and at your own pace, let your breathing deepen. Very gradually, let the awareness of your body <clears throat> against the chair or the floor, or the earth, bring your awareness back to now. Breathing in soft, breathing out belly, soft belly and when you are ready gently open your eyes at this time i want to invite you to take a couple minutes maybe three or four minutes just to write about your experience or maybe even do a quick draw about what you experience in your guided visualization if that doesn't resonate and you wanna just sit in quiet reflection for a few more minutes, we're gonna take about four minutes to jot down what our experience was like so that we can reference it later, especially at a time when we might feel the stress and anxiety peak and we wanna be reminded of this wisdom that we glean from ourselves. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Take another minute, wrap up your thoughts or a quick drawing. I want to invite you to bring yourself to a place of completion or pause for right now. You can always go back to your writing or drawing after this webinar. In fact, I encourage you to. But in the time that we have left before we close, I just want to remind us that when we drop into a guided visualization and a meditative practice like this, we're altering our states of consciousness. I want to encourage us all to be gentle with ourselves right now, to go lightly. It can be helpful to ground yourself 
using the breathing technique that we did at the beginning of this webinar. You can also engage in movement like shaking. Drinking water and eating food is very grounding, helps us bring us back into our bodies. And touch. If you're fortunate to be sheltered in place with someone who you love, touch can be a great way to help us stay calm. But if not, I just wanna show you some tapping techniques that can help bring you into your body fully. A bilateral tapping, you can just tap your legs one leg at a time. You can tap your shoulders. I don't know if you can see me on screen. I'm just doing an alternate tapping of my shoulder. A nice thing to do is to go right underneath the collarbone here. This area is known as our sea of tranquility. I like the idea that I'm stimulating the sea of tranquility within my body. Basically, bilateral tapping or anything where we're crossing our midline, give yourself a great big hug. We're gonna cross our midline, just give ourselves a big hug, bring ourselves right into our bodies. These are things that help us to ground. Going outside, taking your shoes off, putting your feet straight on the earth, that's also a fantastic practice for grounding. Um, in closing, I wanna thank you for being here with us today. Thank you to Connor and Serena for being my awesome support team. And I wanna invite us all to keep connected via social media. So if you're willing and able, I want to invite you to take a photo of the drawing or the sketch that you did or the writing and to share it with us on social media. We'd really like to cultivate community through the sharing of this process and witness each other. And please know that whatever was shared with you from your wise guide, it might also benefit someone else to share that as well. Just like it often benefits me when I learn about the wisdom shared with my participants from their wise guide experiences. So because we are not in a conventional facilitated process and we're doing this online, it would help me to be connected to you through the story of your process. And I invite you to share it. Please look to the link in the, com in the chat section. Serena has posted where you can share this on social media, on Facebook. And um, I really look forward to seeing that. Thank you again so much for spending your morning with us. It's been a tremendous joy, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Take care, and goodbye. <laughs>